Our guest today is the president of DePaul University. He has served as president just over nine years. DePaul University is the nation's largest Catholic university and the largest private university in the Midwest. He is a native of Detroit. Our guest today studied for the priesthood at Mary Immaculate Seminary in Pennsylvania. He was ordained 24 years ago. Ladies and gentlemen, the president of DePaul University, Father Dennis Holtschneider. Father? All right, Father, ha have fun up here. Well, good afternoon. As I said before, that's better than church. Well, I want to thank you all for the warm welcome um, here and outside the door when I came in. I have, uh, it was a, um, it's Chicago at its best. And frankly, um, I'm, a, I'm honored to be with all of you here today. Um, I'm actually not intending to speak directly about the subject that's being spoken about outside, but I will take questions on it at the end and I'll save room for that. Um, but what I thought I would do today um, is, uh, is address another subject, and that's the one that everyone talks about when they get kind of a quiet moment with their friends. Why do higher education costs keep going up? And the right to ask that question. The cost of uh, four-year colleges, um, public four-year colleges, increased 22% over the past five years, even adjusted for inflation. Um, the cost of a private education in the U.S. rose 14% over that same time period, adjusted for inflation. Um, costs are going up faster than inflation. So I figured I'd uh, lift the hood of the car a little today and share a bit about um, what some of us talk about when we talk about this among ourselves. Um, and uh, then open it up for wherever you'd like to take the conversation to go during Q&A. Um, there are two reasons, of course, everybody knows, so we'll dispose of them quickly. And the first is uh, Bill Bowen, of course, um, the economist, former president of Princeton and the Mellon Foundation, first explained this many years ago, that when you have a labor-intensive industry, it's mostly labor as far as costs go, the costs are always going to go up faster than inflation because other industries can actually cut costs by cutting human beings. And they can, they can switch capital for labor. And in fact, we've all watched that happen across many industries, don't we? That is not what happens in higher education. The heart of higher education is what happens in that classroom between a faculty member and a student. And we hire an awful lot of staff to educate our students. And so we are one of those um, institutions that fits Bill Bowen's theory that we are always going to be above the mean when it comes to that. But of course, my colleagues at the state universities have another reason that their costs are rising, of course. Um, govern government support is lessening or not keeping pace with the increasing number of students who are seeking a public education. So they have to shift those costs somewhere, um, as usually as increased tuition. Um, somebody has to pay for those salaries. And so it's, uh, it's, it's tough for everybody as they walk through that. But those two reasons are well known. There's other reasons too, and these put pressure even on private institutions like DePaul. In fact, this is particularly challenging for us because we have St. Vincent DePaul's name over our door. And we work hard to try to make a quality education available to first-generation students, students who are the first in their families to go to college. It's a number we report every year, a number we're very proud, but it is something that we pedal like crazy to try to find a way to make that available to them. Now, David Letterman, of course, has his top 10 list, but this is lunch, so let's cut it in half. <laughs> Here's uh, five more reasons that university prices are rising faster than inflation list. And in usual, I'll do it in reverse order. Reason number five, regulatory compliance. This is the sexy one. <laughs> <laughs> Senator Lamar Alexander once counted, or I assume had his staff count, more than 7,000 federal regulations governing colleges and universities, and that was in 2005. There have been hundreds added since. 
Higher education is, in fact, the only industry that is regulated by every federal agency and is among the most heavily regulated entities in America, according to the American Council on Education. At DePaul, it plays out this way. We had to put our policies online because it was just getting to be too thick to print it on paper. We had to create databases and software to support record keeping requirements. We have a compliance department. We have compliance trainers. We have mandatory compliance training. We have an internal audit office to double check that we are all abiding by the regulations. We hire outside lawyers in addition to our internal general counsel office to make sure all of that's being done. And God bless our board, some of whom are here today, and their audit committee who independently checks on the audit department, who's checking on the compliance department, who are trying to train the rest of us. <laughs> now, there were good intentions for all of these thousands of regulations, I'm sure, but collectively, the amount of reporting, the amount of hiring that I have to do internally adds millions of dollars of cost that we just simply pass on to our students. Um, reason number four, entirely predictable, health benefits. Now nobody needs to tell you about the impact of the rising, the rising cost of health care coverage in this country. At DePaul, in fiscal 2013, Healthcare costs, and by that I mean active medical, dental, and post-retirement medical insurance, were 29.1 million, which represents about 5% of total university operating expenses. And it is growing faster than inflation, rising about 6% a year. And that's not bad considering the national cost trends are rising about 10%. We work hard to try to keep that managed, but it's faster than inflation, there's no doubt about it. Ironically, at the moment at least, healthcare reform too is increasing our costs. The Patient Center's Outcome Research Institute fee is doubling this year to $2 per employee. A new transitional reinsurance fee has just been added, that's $63 per covered life at our university. And further, unless we cut our employees' health benefits, DePaul will need to pay the government roughly half a million dollars or more for having a more generous plan than the, than the government considers standard. All of this we have to pass on to our students. Reason number three, technology. Now many people assume that technology is lowering costs the same as it is in other industries, such as manufacturing. That simply is not true in higher education. Every square inch of DePaul is wireless. Every classroom is a smart classroom. Nearly every student brings a laptop or a tablet, which means we have to staff service to help tie those laptops into our systems and then fix them when necessary. We're the largest, DePaul is the largest graduate school of computer science in the nation. And we provide 45% of Chicago's four-year and graduate computer degrees. And to operate, we need more storage than 22 libraries of Congress and more bandwidth than Google. We're constantly upgrading our equipment, our generators, our cooling systems, our security systems, our software, and we're protecting ourselves from a billion attempts to hack into our system every day, coming from all over the world. And yes, I said a billion a day. Last year, 9.4% of the full-time jobs at DePaul were technology-related. Support positions, perhaps, but technology-related. And nearly one in every $11 is now spent on their salaries. Costs for equipment and services represented 13.8% of non-salary spending, nearly one out of every $7 spent. Together, our IT costs are growing at 7% per year, above inflation. You're hearing a pattern as we do each of these, right? So what's happened is that our education and our services for students have gotten better, but not cheaper. Our advising, because of the new tools, is light years better than it ever was. Our course scheduling is better. Our ability to tell transfer students exactly what they'll have to take is nearly instantaneous. 
our mathematics education is better, our language instruction, science education, our writing programs are all vastly improved because of the, the technology and the software we can use in the classroom. Our investing and finance programs have the same tools as professionals in the field. Our law students have everything at their fingertips that the finest legal firms um, would have. Our film students, our sound recording majors are working with the latest cutting edge technology. Students are getting an extraordinarily better education these days, but not a cheaper one. The new tools are amazing, but they don't save cost. They add cost, which means they add tuition. Thankfully, because of our large size, the ratio of DePaul's IT funding to student is less than many universities nationwide. Our ratio falls around $750 per student, whereas other universities spend somewhere nationally around $1,250. But let me assure you, there is nothing cost-saving about technology, at least in the higher education sector. Reason number two, PhD programs. This one might surprise you. There's been a proliferation of doctoral programs over the past few decades to the point where the number of PhD students that we have in our nation today outpaces the number of jobs available to them on graduation. You'd think, well, sooner or later, the market will correct. If students can't get jobs, or in this case, the right jobs, they'll stop signing up, and universities will have to cut their programs. That doesn't happen, though. And the reason is because universities don't generally put the full cost of their doctoral programs on their doctoral students. It's one of the little secrets in American higher education that the costs of PhD programs are largely borne by undergraduate tuition. There are fortunate universities, of course, that have found ways to fully fund all of their PhD programs through endowment gifts, but far less than you'd think. PhD programs are just expensive. The faculty command higher salaries, they teach far less, only one or two courses a year sometimes, necessitating the hiring of more faculty per student. They require specialized libraries and librarians, laboratories, research centers. They often lead research centers, further reducing the time spent teaching and raising the, the number of other faculty who must be hired per student. There is some research grant money from the NSF and the NIH for limited areas of scientific research, but otherwise universities frequently assist faculty with research costs, as well as costs to send them to professional conferences all over the world. Doctoral students sometimes contribute for providing teaching or research assistance, but the great bulk of the costs get paid from the university's general kitty, which is largely funded by undergraduate, or in some cases, the master's students. Why do universities build, then, more PhD programs than are needed? Because they're in desperate search for the prestige factor. And more immediately, because those programs can serve magazine rankings. A number of the, other, a number of the criteria for higher magazine, for, for magazine rankings are directly related to the expenditures that are made for PhD programs. Now DePaul decided a number of years ago to cap the number of PhD programs that we offer for exactly the reason that we didn't want to put pressure on the younger students who shouldn't have to pay for them. We run five in nursing, education, computer science, philosophy, and psychology. And we'll soon announce a sixth. We keep them small, we keep them highly competitive, and that makes them highly sought after programs while minimizing the costs that we have to shift from others to pay for them. But that's not the case nationally. Reason number one, the research function. Last year, the Davis Educational Foundation asked 70 college and university presidents, what is accelerating the cost of education? One of the top answers, teaching load. Teaching loads do vary greatly from university to university, sometimes as high as nine or 10, sometimes as low as two or even one course a year. 
Whatever the usual load, there are opportunities to lessen it further through leaves, taking out administrative projects, buying out time for research. The truth is, teaching loads have been quietly and unperceptibly going down for decades now. The reason for this is that our faculty are expected, ever increasingly, to produce important research or creative activity in their professional fields. We require it for promotion, we believe it's good for the students to be taught by those who are actively producing knowledge in their fields, and that it's good for faculty to stay alive and current throughout the arc of an academic career. But make no mistake, this has a cost. The less faculty teaching, the more faculty who must be hired per student. And as faculty hand off traditional advising duties, staff have to be hired to do the advising, another clear trend <laughs> in higher education. People often think that university research must be paid by government or corporations or large foundations, and that happens still, but mostly in specific scientific fields or in shifting areas of social concern. But for the most part, the costs of faculty research are borne by the students. In the end, the single largest cost driver in any university is salaries. And the primary activity driving the number of faculty per student is an institutional decision on the amount of research that it will expect from its faculty. It is another of those little secrets of American higher education that the research function is largely supported by student tuition, not outside funding. Now I started this talk, of course, showing you that some costs were not in our control. We're simply passing along to the students the costs that we're incurring from outside forces, regulatory costs, health costs, to a degree, IT costs. But I shifted towards decisions that are within a university's control, but that universities ignore at their peril. This is a highly competitive business. We're extremely price sensitive. Prestige and reputation matter greatly. At the graduate level, rankings matter tremendously. And so eventually, universities draw a quality line in the sand. And they decide how expensive an education will be at their institution that they wish to create and thus sell. What quality of faculty will they pay for? What quality of facilities will they give their students? More often than not, DePaul has decided in recent years to invest in the quality side of faculty and facilities, but stay conservative on the teaching load and the PhD programs. We've tried to remain disciplined there so we can keep student costs in check. We pursue partnerships wherever we can, something I suspect you'll want to ask me about in a few minutes. But we're not cheap. We made a decision, too, about the level of quality that we want to provide our students, and we let our students decide whether they want to pay the costs associated with that level of quality. It's the classic decision, isn't it? trying to find the sweet spot in the market where excellence and achievable price point coincide. In the end, it's a value proposition. Are we providing the caliber of education that will truly propel students into a successful and competitive future? In a city like Chicago, people talk. And people know if a school is first rate or not. And the market tells us, too, immediately, if that's working. But it's a combination of chasing prestige and managing imposed costs that we don't control. None of this adds up to a typical Letterman punchline, but at least it's the truth. <laughs> but enough said. I thank you for your kindness, for the many ways that you make this city such a special place. What questions of yours can I answer? If you have a question, just raise your hand, and one of our city club well-paid uh, uh, interns will. Uh. <laughs> By the way, Father, no one ever got tenure because of university service. I just want speaking for the faculty on that one. <laughs> right, Mr. Donovan? <laughs> Damn right. OK, Bef before we ask these critical questions, we have to introduce some people that we missed. Direct from his uh, spectacular show on uh, with Mike Flannery, State Senator Kwame Raoul. Kwame, raise your hand. There you are. 
As we said before, you got a lot of free time because there's no crisis about that pension thing. We know that. Uh, we have uh, Alderman Michelle Smith from the Fighting 43rd. We got Alderman Scott Wadenbuck from the Fighting 32nd. Where are you, Scott? Right there. And then someday I'll pronounce your name correctly. It's, it'll be a while. If you ran for mayor, by the way, it'd be easier. Um, and the former Fighting 43rd Alderman, Vi Daly. Okay. Questions are flowing in. Okay, here we go. Uh, <laughs> Alderman Smith, 43rd Ward. Always give them a. What want to comment about the Paul neighborhood and partnership with the community? Okay. Wide enough for you to. Thank you. DePaul is in several uh, communities of Chicago with our different, um, different um, uh, campuses and involvements. Um, but of course, uh, our, our, we often point to our relationship in Lincoln Park as a long established relationship of how we like to work together with the community. And so you've watched over the years as we've built um, new classroom buildings and art museums and now the new theater school that just was, um, went up several weeks ago. Um, literally designed with community leaders and changed constantly. Um, we are on a conversation right now of how to, uh, how to think about the use of uh, Kenmore Street that uh, continues to be part of a conversation. We tend to take our time with these things and try to see how they can be improved. And truthfully, we probably wouldn't have the art museum where we have it except for the community talking to us about how they wanted that neighborhood shaped. And some of the designs have turned out better. Um, so it is a, it's, we've learned over time it's been worth our time as a university to spend time with the community and let them um, shape our own plans. And that's, that's been a long thing. So I'm not sure if that answers your question or not. Actually, I want to make a comment about it. Oh, fine. Thank you very much. And I'm enjoying the irony right now. <laughs> <laughs> you want to call it a day after that? <laughs> All right. Uh, we have a lot of questions on the same subject, so I'm going to save them to the end so our friends out there can keep chanting. Elizabeth Clements asked a very good question. Where are you, Elizabeth? All right. Very good. I've, I've read that some... <laughs> I've read that some media are questioning the value of a college degree. How dare they? What do you think? Is a college degree worth it? Now that is the legendary softball. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, a DePaul one certainly is. <laughs> <laughs> And, and, of course, that of all my fellow college presidents who are in the room. <laughs> um, I, you know, the, the latest da uh, data came out on this, and I think the latest data I saw is that um, not only is what you're going to make in your life more than twice because of a college degree, just on average across the United States, but the real interesting piece is the percentage of those who actually have a job. Those with a four-year degree right now in the U.S. is only a 2% unemployment rate. Um, those without it is much, much, much higher. Um, so it really comes at both. It is still very true that a college degree makes all the difference. The interesting questions people have these days are which college degree and which major, given the cost. And that's a really interesting set of questions. Okay, we have a, uh, that's enough. We, we got enough questions so that they can get hoarse out there screaming. So what's a, we're gonna move fast. A little shorter answer, shorter questions. Uh, <laughs> When you can talk to a college president like that, you have no idea how that feels. Uh, from Glenn Mazzotti. Where are you, Glenn? All right, there you are, Mazzotti. 
uh, RBS citizens. What, what are the educational expense allotted to online courses? Uh, you know, is this going to be a, the future? To a degree, it's, it's, um, it's definitely under development. There are some subjects right now that I think are taught exceptionally well with some of the new electronic tools that are available, and many subjects right now that are not. And so we are, we are early in the development of something that's going to be very interesting to watch. And DePaul has made a just kind of a steady commitment. We're about 10% online now. And we're moving up piece by piece. Um, but we're trying to do it on the side of only taking the pieces that we think are at the quality level where it's the same as in person. But this, uh, this is a, a watch and stay tuned kind of a thing. We have a couple of more before we come to the one that most of the questions are about and that will be a, the long answer. Uh, Lynn, Sophronic, is that close enough? Close enough for me. DePaul just opened a new theater, uh, ju just opened a new theater, school building, uh, and it's Lincoln Park campus. Does the university have any other development planned on that campus? I think that um, uh, the one project you all know, of course, is, um, you know, I think your question's coming up next. I think that the one project we have that's going to be looked at in Lincoln Park is simply something for our music school. It's now ranked one of the best in the country and we're going to try to get it out of its office building and into proper facilities that actually are, are right for the training of musicians. But we have some more fundraising to do. We try to do things without adding tuition dollars to the students and so we're in fundraising mode at the moment and I look forward to being able to move that project forward in time. Shall we get to the question one more, we're all we have, waiting? We have one more because despite what they say, this is the city club where we give everybody a chance, including a different university. Uh, Bill Laird, where are you? Loyola University. Private universities with small endowments but have the mission to educate the poor have a specific financial challenge. How does DePaul view this matter? Well, I would love a larger endowment. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'll, 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 I'll argue that there, there's two things about having a smaller endowment, however, that was good. When, when the economy tanked in 2008, we weren't borrowing to make payroll um, because we weren't dependent on the endowment for payroll, um, and many of our better off institutions and colleagues were. Um, and certainly, they force you to get the business right. They force you to pay attention to the market when you can't fund what you're doing just from dollars that are in the bank. So they force you to be kind of close to the street. Uh, and, that's, uh, and so in some ways, those are the two blessings of something that we would love to still grow because you've watched the government have to pull back from its commitment to scholarships and financial aid. And we're trying like crazy to raise money to make up for that difference, but we'll never make up for the whole difference. But we're trying desperately. And that's from, for a place like DePaul, and I know for yourself too, it's the heart of much of what we do. And so I will, when they become a college president, they teach you a secret handshake, and it looks like this. <laughs> and you can be sure we'll all be using that, so thank you. Pretty cool line. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to just let the father answer these. Francesco De Salvatore, Adeline Gracie, Stacy Bear, and a few others. Uh, could you run through the whole question of what's going on in McCormick Place area with your arena, how you're going to finance it, why you're going to finance it, et cetera, et cetera? Yet five minutes or more, or less. <laughs> Happy to do it. Um, I, I, I'll go past quickly the part that you know. You know that this is a. Uh, this is a three-way project that um, none of us could do, we could do alone. This is a convention center that very much wants to increase the kinds of conventions that come to the city, but doesn't have the, the funds to put towards that on their own. This is a city who is actually very ambitious to bring conventioners to the city, to, br to bring their income to town, and then being able to fund things that the city cares about. And of course, it's a university that's looking for a home for our team. Um, none of us would do this if we were on our own, but the putting our resources together in three ways, suddenly something becomes possible for all of us. The piece that I think that's sometimes misunderstood is 
DePaul's going to use this facility about 30 days a year. Well, exactly 30 days a year. That's the contract, the terms. Um, probably not even whole days. And we're going to put in a third of the cost of its construction, and then we're going to pay full rent every day we use it. So you can ask me if I had the right people negotiating for DePaul. Uh, <laughs> but I can assure you um, that there's, there's, no, there's no way that when people accuse DePaul of having um, somehow received benefit financially from this, that's the case. I think, if anything, DePaul's been generous to Chicago. But truthfully, none of us could do this without each other. Um, you know, the, there's questions, of course, about the use of TIF funds. That's, that's the heart of what you're hearing outside. Um, and uh, that's a fair question in the city, how it should use its money for what public purposes. Um, I'll let the city speak to that question because that was their call. I know how I pulled together the 70 million from DePaul. We did it in a way that the students won't pay a dollar. We're going to do it strictly through outside fundraising sources um, and, um, and through the sales of to game day tickets and whatnot. So there will be zero dollars into Paul's budget for this, and that's how we've gone about funding it. Um, but the city had to make a call on whether this was a project that would benefit the city in the long run, and that, I think that's theirs to, to argue. Um, so. I can't hear you, I'm sorry. I, That's a great question, and when the mayor comes here, you should ask the mayor that question. You listen to what he said. That's not the Paul's responsibility. All right, this is the City Club. You're out of order. Be seated or you'll be kicked out. On behalf of the City Club, let's have a great round of applause for our speaker.